All right, welcome into Sports Bit. Betty and Inside today, Paulie and Teddy, Tuesday, April 12th. Deep Dive's going to be going after some of these bad bullpens and the horrific start for a lot of teams. Play of the day, as always. Big game breakdown. We got the Heat and the Pistons, a huge game coming up tonight. And two in baseball with the Marlins and the Mets and the Giants and the Rockies. We start with bad beats and what? What? Do we, here we go, Teddy. We got an in. Uh, confusion was contagious in his Phillies game. We got an infield fly rule that turned out to be problematic for the Phillies, and all hell broke loose on the base pass. Well, yeah, the ump calls the infield fly. Okay, we got, uh, let's let's set the story right uh-huh. here. Philadelphia is down three to two, and the Phillies. You know, any game they have a chance to win that they don't win is brutal because they're not going to win that many games. So they're minus 120. The total sitting at eight. The score's three to two, San Diego, bottom of the six. But Phillies have bases loaded, nobody out. So Darren Ruff's up, and he hits one that might fall in the shallow left field. It's not an infield fly. It's on the grass in the outfield. Uh But the ump makes the call and says, infield fly rule. The players don't think it's an infield fly rule. Everybody's running. So, boom, you get the out, then you make a tag out, double play, one run scores, uh, the next batter goes 3-0 and and then strikes out, <laughs> and the game is tied, bases loaded, nobody out. You're supposed to take the lead in that situation. Yep. Philly ends up losing on a sacrifice squeeze, or a squeeze bunt uh, by a single run, and it was a really tough beat where the umpire making a judgment call affects side, affects total in a big way. Pete Mackinnon, Philly's manager, Let's put it this way. Pissed. I didn't like the call, but we have to live with it. We just have to get past it. We had opportunities after that. It was a big play, obviously. Although, like I said, I didn't like the call. You know, uh, Darren Ruff, if you're on the bases running, uh, it's hard, especially when there's 45,000 people to hear an umpire yell. You're certainly not looking for him to point. So when you see the ball that drop, uh, drop that far into the outfield, your natural instincts are to try and advance. Philly did everything right, and it still cost them. Uh, tough beat for Philly's backers and or for over betters. Yep, they weren't happy, and, and a good breakdown of that. Now you got the Reds. Reds to win. Reds plus the run and a half. Vicious beat. The Cubs were getting no hit in the seventh inning. They only had three hits the entire game. Another bullpen blow up. They go to the pen in the eighth. Reds still have the lead. Walk, hit by pitch, and Russell hits a three-run bomb, and the Cubs cover the run line. <laughs> we were talking about that Chicago is going to be a team that the bookies are absolutely going to hate all summer long. Did it again tonight, cashing over bets, cashing Cubs bets. And the only ones who were betting on the Reds in that game, right side, wrong result, were the wise guys. And nobody cares when the wise guys get pounded no. in MLB, right? No, no. The <laughs> All right, time for NBA. Now, how about this, this OKC Lakers total? This started slow, then it picked up in the second quarter, and a lot of guys were just going for their stats. Westbrook again gets a triple-double. He ties Magic for the most triple-doubles in the last 40 seasons, and then the game died in the fourth quarter. Oh, my God. Well, Westbrook did not just have a triple-double. He had a triple-double by halftime in a meaningless game. There's been some talk that OKC has been stat-chasing, shall we say, Mm. and that has been a part of some of their fourth-quarter meltdowns and some of their point-spread failures. And certainly when you're seeing Westbrook get a triple-double at halftime against the Lakers, I'm impressed with Russell Westbrook. I really am. It had that feel to it. But what, the Thunder scored two points the last six minutes, and the two teams combined to miss 112 shots. That's a miss for every 25.7 seconds. Lakers shoot 28% from the floor on the second of back-to-backs. The pace was there. Yep. But the points on the scoreboard were not uh, bad news, obviously, if you had the over in that ball game. And we talked about this game yesterday, Jazz and the Mavericks under. This was sitting on 151 with six minutes left, and then that end game scramble went crazy. It was 168 with 230 left. Yeah, you're sitting with an under. You have an under 182 ticket in your pocket. You know, you're feeling pretty good at 151 with six minutes left. You're feeling pretty good at 168. With two and a half left. And then, as you mentioned, all hell breaks loose. 13 to 12 the last two and a half minutes. They're hitting threes. They're hitting free throws. And, of course, the Jazz were fighting till the bitter end. And when you're fighting till the bitter end in a tight game and it's close enough to foul, you can get some of these late, mm-hmm. uh, uh, the late, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, 
<laughs> late points, <laughs> late scramble points in bunches. And, and that's obviously what happened if you had the Mavs Jazz under last night. But while there was a bad beat in that game, there was also a bad bet. Oh, sure. Ollie. Yeah, yep. Utah was not a right side there. They were laying. They took a bunch of money throughout the course of the day. And the Jazz, I've been impressed with the Jazz team. But you know what? You know, right now they're tied with Utah for the number eight seed or with Houston for the number eight seed, and the Rockets don't exactly have a tough <laughs> game Let me jump in. opponent. Yeah. And, of course, they get uh, – uh, Houston wins a tiebreaker because they won the season series against Utah. So, tough for the Jazz. Young team, they will get better. Disappointing to see them probably not going to make the postseason. I don't want to hear it. I'm already, I already saw the garbage on Twitter last night. It's not fair. The Kings aren't going to play Cousins and Rondo. Get out of here. It's De Niro and Copland. You blew it. You blew it. They had a horrible loss Friday against the Clippers, and the Clippers set everybody in that game. What were the Jazz laying? 14 Friday night? Lost yeah, the yeah, game yeah. outright. That's why they're going to miss the playoffs. Yes, agree, Hole. You're all upset about it. It's they're a young team. As we saw again last night, they may not be up for shining under the spotlight, but I really wanted to take Utah plus 15 or plus 16 against Golden State. I thought that was going to be a good bet on the road in the first round, and now I'm probably not going to get that opportunity. Uh, the Ca- the Cavs beat the Hawks again, another bad bet, Atlanta. They've lost seven in a row to the Cavs. LeBron torched them in this one. They had no answer again. Yeah, LeBron 13 of 16 from the field. He made all five free throws. A- and, you know, we're starting to hear some of these quotes coming out of that Cleveland locker room. Here's Tyrone Liu. I hope he can keep it up. If he plays like this, man, we're going to be tough to beat. He's just taken it to a whole other level the last three or four weeks, playing at a very high level, shooting the ball very well, shooting it with confidence, and also getting it to the basket. I like the LeBron I see right now. How about the LeBron himself? Quote, it's just a feeling. It's not a game. It's not the time of the month. It's just a feeling, and I know it, and I know when the switch needs to be turned on for me, and I was able to do that for my team. Bad news for an Atlanta squad that, as you mentioned, they haven't beaten the Hawks since the start of the playoffs of last year, and that's a team, obviously, they're going to have to get through if they're going to come out of the East. I was surprised by this line. The Suns were laying six, six and a half. They can't be laying points. They lost at home to the Kings. Yeah, I mean, uh, there are teams, there are some bad teams we talked about. Hey, they're laying points. Maybe you're interested. You know, New Orleans, when they were laying points over the back half of the campaign, they were winning and covering. Phoenix, not so much. But what about in baseball? I mean, the Mets laying a buck sixty with Mats against Cozart. Oh, they got blown out at home. And our play of the day, Paul, from yep. yesterday, that was no good. Chris Young got lit up in Houston. And uh, thinking about it in retrospect, when you lose a bet, the most, the worst thing you can do is go, "Oh, I'm an idiot." Da, 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 da. What you want to do is re-handicap it. I call it post mortem. I do it every night uh, after the games are through. I say, where was my thought process wrong? What can I do to make this better? Was I unlucky, et cetera, et cetera. In this case, with Chris Young, man, I want this guy in pitcher-friendly venues. When you can get the long fly ball outs, Chris Young is a bet on hurler in Houston. He was giving up extra base hits. And it felt like every time the Astros were at bat, they were getting an extra base hit off Young, including a dinger uh, from Colby Rasmus that changed the game early. We want Young in pitcher-friendly venues. Bad bet on Kansas City last night. All right, up next, big game breakdown. We'll start with the Heat and the Pistons. A huge game with playoff implications and seeding implications as well. That's coming up on Sportsbit. Betting insight today. All right, let's do it. Big game breakdown. The Heat on the road to take on the Pistons. Detroit laying two and a half, total of 202. Fascinating matchup here. Again, you look at the Eastern Conference standings with only two games left. Atlanta's the three seed. Miami's only a half game back. They're the four, and Boston and Charlotte now tied at 47-34 and 34 for the fifth seed. Now, Detroit is the eighth seed. They're tied with Indiana, but they lose the tiebreaker because of head-to-head record. So the Pistons don't want any part of the Cavs in the first round. They played last week. The Heat were laying four and a half. They beat Detroit 107-89, to 89, Teddy, and Dragic carried Wade. He was huge in that game. Yeah, he certainly was. Uh, you know, Dragic in that ball game. What do you have? 22 points, 8 assists, 5 rebounds, 4 of 4 from 3-point land. Miami had 6 players in double figures. And that's one of the things that makes the Heat 
dangerous here in the postseason. They do have the balance. They do have the veterans who are capable of stepping up in the postseason. And, you know, you go back to that original graphic showing uh, at the standings from three through six. Remember, the top two teams on that list, they're going to get first round on the home court. And the top team on that list doesn't have to face the Cavs until the Eastern Conference Finals. So mm-hmm. the difference between three and four and five, enormous in the Eastern Conference. And as uh, we talked about, not much separating these two te- these three teams. Miami certainly with a lot to play for, as does Detroit. But, you know, you talk about Dragic and the success he had. What about the Pistons right now? You know, they've got uh, three straight off days at home. And, you know, maybe the NBA tried to screw up and give it to them because they thought there was no chance of the Pistons making the playoffs this year. But Stan Van Gundy, man, uh, you know, we talked about him and his leadership with the Pistons. I'm liking Stan Van Gundy more and more, especially in response to this Andre Drummond situation. What do you think of that social media thing there? That's interesting. Well, you know, I mean, it's, it's kind of funny because Drummond didn't do anything. What he did during the game, he got benched. Uh, Van Gunn, Van Gunny does that. He benches guys, and uh, he doesn't bench him like, "Oh, I hate you." He benches you, "Hey, you're not playing hard enough. You're doing." You're not, you're, uh, uh, so Drummond was a little bit frustrated. He sat on the end of the bench by himself, and the social media just blew up. You know, oh, the, the, the Van Gundy and Gunman, Drummond, they can't get along. This guy's a jerk. Yada uh-huh. yada yada. Van Gundy, sharp man. You look at his quote. I think sometimes, and I've said it to you guys before too, talking to the reporter. When a guy says something backs to me or reacts wrong in a game or whatever it is, I think people are too quick to criticize guys for that stuff. That's in the heat of a moment. Every once in a while, frustration and stuff show. It certainly does in me. That has nothing to do with what kind of a guy he is or how unselfish he is or what kind of a teammate he is. As a guy who had a meltdown on an airplane <laughs> uh, last week, I could say, yeah, sometimes, and, and you know, and I'm supposed to be a you know, 40-something-year-old man. I'm supposed to be, uh, I'm not as young and hot-headed as I used to be, Paul. Yeah. But the, the microscope that these guys are under, Van Gundy's, take the pressure off, you know, let it down a little bit. Uh, and I think that is very, very positive for this Piston team. Don't know if it's going to be positive enough for them to get past Miami tonight, but it's a positive for this team moving forward. He'd have been dynamite at home, not so much on the road. Something to factor in tonight in that game. Let's go to baseball. The Marlins and the Mets. Fernandez against Syndergaard. Thor is $1.40. Total of six. Some five and a halfs out there as well. More on that in a second. Now, Fernandez, you want to say, yeah, look at the box score. He got roughed up. He he went five and two-thirds, and his ERA was seven, two-four. But... 13 strikeouts, struck out 13 of the 23 batters he faced. 72 of the 106 pitches were for strikes, and only eight balls were put in the field. Only, uh, yeah, only eight balls were put in the field to play, Teddy. So this guy really had had the command work, and it was dominant, even though he had some bad luck. Yeah, I mean, what's the old expression? Lies, damn lies, and statistics. Yes. You know, <laughs> Jose Fernandez pitched brilliantly. I don't know if anyone pitched better than Jose Fernandez in, in his opening day uh, start. And he got, you know, the box score says he got lit up. You know, he's got 0-1-1. He's got an ERA over 7. Uh, he also had a 500 BABIP in that ball game, As you mentioned, eight balls field, put, put, put in the field of play. Four of them fell in for hits. Um, certainly for off that opening day loss, or the day after opening day uh, for Fernandez. Uh, it's certainly frustrating for him. But, you know, if you're an old school guy that gets up with a cup of coffee and checks the pitching form in the newspaper – then you already know <laughs> that uh, some of those numbers are going to tell lies. And the Jose Fernandez number, certainly early on, nothing but lies. All right. Uh, the uh, well, wait, One more second. How about the total? Oh, how, how about this? Some five and a halves here. Yeah, I mean, and, and the uh, totals don't really get any lower than five and a half. Uh, you were saying that you thought you saw a five once. Yeah. I, I'm, I don't ever remember seeing a five. Um, you know, it used to be you didn't see much lower than six and a half, and then they kind of went to the six barrier, and now the five and a halfs you're seeing them in the regular season. You know, I mean, a, a five and a half used to be Kershaw versus Bumgartner, you yep. know, and that's the one five and a half that you'd see. Mm-hmm. Pitchers Park, two aces, and, and even that, what you would see sixes at most books, five and a half here, but that's got a lot to do with Syndicard. You know, uh, I don't know if you've been following his offseason. This guy threw his slider. His slider at 91 miles an hour in the opener, including one of them at top 95. 
So here's a guy that has an unhittable pitch with the slider to go with an unhittable fastball. He's throwing 100 and an almost unhittable curveball. And this is a new pitcher for a new pitch for him. The, the it's called the Warthen slider, and only the Mets are teaching it. And Degrom's throwing it, and Harvey's throwing it, nice. and now Syndergaard's throwing it. And I'm telling you what, this guy's like a video game pitcher right now. Hey, you know, he's got a blazer that you can't catch up with. He's got a curveball that buckles your knees, and he now, now he's got the slider that no one seems to be able to hit. Uh, runs I do not expect to come quite as easy. <laughs> tomorrow or today, I should say, uh, as they did yesterday. Got a little bit of Roger Clemens in him too. That I that attitude. I own the inside of the inside of the plate. That's mine. Not afraid to throw it, guys either. To the Giants and the Rockies, Samarja against Chatwood. Giants one twenty five total of eleven. The only thing that could keep Trevor Story out of the headlines was the schedule. No game for the Rockies as he didn't play it in a home run. This has been an incredible story. Although I got a little Rob Deer in him. I mean, he's all or nothing when you look. It's either a home run or bust. But you know, the schedule started out. They got the Diamondbacks, and they were at home against the Padres. That's not going to continue when it's the Dodgers and the Padres and the Giants. So don't expect this. The guy's on pace for 240 home runs. So this is, this is getting, it's a good story, but it's getting crazy. Yeah, and again, I mean, it couldn't have been a better opening for story. You know, you have Chase Field with the roof open, and then you're playing at Coors. You know, those home runs, they're all outs when you're in L.A. They're all outs in San Diego. They're all outs in San Francisco. Now, this kid's a legit talent, and he's actually been a bit unlucky. He's only got a 167 BABIP, of course, batting average on balls in play. So when he hasn't hit home run, he's been a little bit unlucky. But, you know, when you talk about the impressive starts to the season, I know that this kid's story has been impressive, but boy, that Giants offense may have been the most impressive. 43 runs in six games, Paul. Not just punch, but patience as well. Mm -hmm. And he got Samarja. He did not pitch well against the Brewers in the first time out. 98 pitches at Milwaukee. Only went five and a third. 11 of the 26 batters reached. So... It, it Coors, he's got to do a better job, and he's got to live up to the hype. Just like Cueto, they threw a ton of money at him in the offseason with a big deal. Yeah, but I, I want to talk about that giant strikeout rate, you know, because this is a big deal uh, for San Francisco so far. The MLB average, they're striking out about 22% of the time. In fact, exactly 22.2% of the, giant, the time. Giants, that patience at the plate, they're putting the ball into play. Only 13% of the time have they struck out this season. That's number one in the major leagues. They should be able to put the ball in play against Chatwood. Remember, Chatwood's off his second Tommy John surgery, and this guy is not a strikeout hurler. He's not going to miss a lot of bats. This game will also be part of the play of the day coming up, and up next it's the deep dive where we get into the bullpens. What is going on here with all these blown leads? And we'll run down some great stats to back it up on Sportsbit. Betting insight today. All right, wrapping it up on Sports Pit Play of the Day, money time coming up. Let's look at the deep dive, and today it's going to be what went wrong in week one with the bullpens. And just look at this graphic. It's astonishing. ERA, 2006, 2000, excuse me, 2016, 2015, and 2014. You look at 3.83, 3.71, and 3.58. The fielding independent pitching, it's advanced metric for ERA, that's up big time. K's through nine innings, walks per nine innings, 3-6, 3-3, 3-3, home runs, and batting average on balls in play. That's all, that's going to go up as well. So everything except the bat pip is going wrong in every single category, Teddy. What is going on here? Well, I mean, when you look down into some of these bullpens, there's a whole lot of empty out there, you know. And we've seen this growing pecking order in Major League Baseball where the starters keep getting better and then the hitters keep getting better. The pitchers keep getting better. And the hitters keep getting get, getting better. And the bullpens have been very specialized. The teams with the best bullpens are guys that can come in, they're going to face the one lefty, and then they're going to get them out, what St. Louis has been doing uh -huh. uh, in recent seasons. The teams that don't have that and they don't have the starting pitching to let the bullpen stay fresh and they don't have those big arms coming out of the pen. And they're on limited payroll, so they're losing their better relievers. Because I'll tell you what, uh, bullpen, uh, bullpen ability and team's willingness to spend 
really go hand in hand um, because you're not going to spend $20 million on a reliever or $10 million bucks on a reliever if you're a small market squad or you're trying to save money. So the better and bigger market teams tend to end up with the better bullpens. All of these factors combine right into that graph because, again, this graph is so crucial. Look at the ERA. So far, again, we're a week into the season, but the ERA went up last year, uh, up going up in this, this year. XFIP going up, strikeouts going down, walks going up, home runs per nine going up. And, oh, by the way, the relief pitchers have been luckier with the batting average on balls in play uh, this year than they've been in the last two years. We would expect that to normalize as well. So some really ugly bullpen meltdowns over that first week of the season, Paul. And you know what, you know what we're going to see? We're going to see more of them. You've got the Rockies, Braves, Phillies, Padres, Tigers. They've separated themselves from a bad group, but these guys have been terrible too. I mean, you look what's going on with Atlanta. That's three blown leads already. So what does this mean for betters here, and how do we take advantage of this? Well, yeah, and again, these are some of the uh, – we did an interview last week uh, right here on Sports, but with Rob Vino, who I consider to be one of the true bullpen experts. And these were all teams that he listed as having bad bullpens coming into the season. If you watch them play, they've all lived up to those expectations. If you look at the current standings, all of these bullpens have absolutely stunk so far. Mm-hmm. So even in a year where the bullpens are bad – these are some of the teams that are, made, are, are leading the charge in bullpens. Rockies, Braves, Phillies, Padres, Tigers. What do you do? You don't bet on them. When you bet against them, you bet on the money line, uh, on the run line, I should say, instead of the money line to maximize your return. And maybe you're looking to bet some of these teams over the total. But for as much as the bad bullpens separate teams, there's a good handful of excellent bullpens that have really exceeded expectations in early season play. And those teams are the exact opposite, Paul. Yeah, and we knew what to expect from the Yankees, although with Chapman's suspension. But Yankees, Mets, Orioles. How about that? I mean, the Orioles still are undefeated. you got the Red Sox, Giants, Rays, and the Cubs as well. So they, they're separating themselves. And some of these teams have been a pleasant surprise too. Well, I, well A and B go hand in hand. You know, these are all teams. There's not a one of these teams that's been a disappointment. Yankees, Mets, Orioles, Red Sox, Giants, Rays, Cubs, Cardinals. You know, they all have been playing up to expectation or exceeding expectation. Again, we're a week into this season, and it's already crystal clear. These teams, you get in the 6th, 7th, 8th, ninth innings, they're going to close out games with wins. Mm-hmm. These are teams that you can bet on the run line as opposed to the ones that you can't or that you want to bet against on the run line with the bad bullpens. These are teams that, in theory, you can bet under the total where you sure as heck don't want to be betting the teams with the bad bullpens uh, under the total. So none of this is rocket science. This is all stuff that we thought about and talked about last week, and it's all coming to fruition in front of our eyes. Bad bullpens, good bullpens. The dichotomy is enormous. And here in 2016, like we said, a lot more bad bullpens than good ones. But those elite bullpens... Those are going to be bet on teams all year. Watch and see. And you said yep. Baltimore. That was one that Rob Vino stood out. He says, nobody likes this bullpen. I like this bullpen. Yep. The Orioles bullpen's been real good so far. And as you mentioned, they haven't lost a game yet. Yeah, that was excellent by Rob Vino. And I, I was not high on the Orioles, and they have been a pleasant surprise so far. All right, let's go to the play of the day. Let's turn this around. Betting number 959. We're taking the Giants minus 125 on the road. They broke out of it. Bats came alive. They were down 5 nothing at home to the Dodgers. They came back to win. They roughed up Casimir. Now they go to Coors. We think the offense is going to continue. More runs, runs, runs. And Posey leads the charge. He's hitting 391. Let's take the Giants as the play of the day. The rest of the week, some guests, NBA playoffs right around the corner, NHL playoffs, all that coming up. Of course, big game breakdown. Paulie and Teddy, sports bit. Betting insight today.